Uh, we'll call to order the Fayette County Board of Education work session for May 6th. Um, can we have uh, any changes to the agenda? No, sir. We're all good for the agenda as recommended by the board. Can we have a um, motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? 5 0. All right. Dr. Bear, I'll turn it over to you for our presentations. Um, first uh, on the agenda is developing highly effective staff. This is part of our uh, goals and uh, uh, model of achievement, uh, accountability, and uh, Dr. Turner is going to come and share goal three, performance two. Good afternoon. Originally, we were scheduled to bring information regarding pathway completion for this month, um, but I put that schedule together when I was new to this job and uh, didn't realize we would need to wait until the year ended to get that uh, data. So we're tweaking our schedule just a little bit, and we thought we would bring to you today information on Goal 3, Performance Objective 2, which is developing highly effective staff. Um, Ms. Ray Presley King is here presenting with me. Uh, Kim Heron would have been here, but she has her Principals Connection Day in which um, she is connecting principals and their instructional coaches today uh, to further flesh out um, those relationships and roles so that whenever they go into next year, they know where they need to improve upon and what's working really well. Um, so in looking at the information that we're going to present for you here today, if we can go on to the next one, what we wanted to do is give you an idea of all the professional learning that we deliver to our certified staff, and we're also going to give you, uh, we've shared information about our administrative staff. Of course, for us, each school year starts out with new teacher induction, and then um, where we take everyone who's a new hire in the county and try to um, bring them into the Fayette County way of doing things. Um, and then it goes on to job embedded professional learning that is school-based where principals are de designing the kind of PL that they need based on what their needs are. And sometimes this is position specific, um, such as we've been heavily involved in the Georgia State Coaching Collaborative with our instructional coaches and our digital learning specialist. Um, Ms. Henley has been very involved with PBIS, early learning. Ms. Ray Presley King with our Woodruff Arts Partnership. And uh, then of course we've had Tracy Fleming coming back to work with first-year teachers and first-year administrators. Um, the link to our system-wide professional learning schedule gives you an idea of what we've offered throughout the school year for teachers. So if, that, if you open that link and look in that further, you'll see a long list for, for school year 18-19 of all the things that we've delivered. We think we pretty much have everything on that list, and you can see that. We've also done some work on learning in the fast lane where we brought in Susie Pepper Rollins, and then we did the uh, primary grades uh, ed camp that Kate Matthews and Kim Heron put together for K-1 and 2 teachers so that those K-1 and teachers especially could share what was working in terms of our standards-based reporting. And then, of course, we're going to end the year with um, – a great event called the What Works Expo, our WWE, uh, that was initiated by Rosie Gwynn, but it is, um, it's inclusive of special ed and gen ed teachers. Um, Ms. Presley King, do you want to come and talk about the next slide, which is about our administrative PL? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, our net, when, at the beginning of each year, this is, for me, this is the beginning of the year, which is that first, the second week in July, I mean, I'm sorry, in June, and in June we actually meet, we bring all of our administrators together. We bring building level administrators, we bring district level administrators, school board members, and our admin interns. And the admin interns um, actually, pro they, they're there, they're, they actually, in the past, we have used them kind of um, to help us with the Admin Institute, but now they are a part of our, um, our learning team. The, um, if you have a chance to click on the link, you'll get to see what we did last year. And um, thank you, Dr. Marchman, for coming and, uh, and starting off the day. I, I, it started off really early, and thank you, Dr. Marchman, for being there, and Dr. Barrow. 
But this year we're going to do the same thing, but this year, last year we focused on instructional leadership, and this year we're going to continue focusing on instructional leadership, except for we are going to now look at the strategic plan and how it connects to school <coughs> improvement. So I hope that all of you have a chance to come out on uh, June 11th and 12th. The um, internship program, which I briefly mentioned before, is when we have a chance to take teacher leaders and um, give, them a to give them a chance to look at building level leadership and decide whether or not they're a good fit for that. Um, that program lasts from January to July, but we actually start interviewing in December. Um, each year we choose a different number, usually around six. One year we had seven, one year we had four. This year we're back to six, and um, it's a great group of individuals. The um, GLSSI, which I'm sure all of you have heard, but um, the Georgia Leadership Institute for School Improvement, We've been working with them for years, more than 10 years, and uh, they provide a lot of our leadership for our principals and our, admin our other administrators. But the biggest thing is um, they're now work they, they challenge us to work on a problem when we come. So we bring a group and we have, if there's, whether it's um, working with our guidance counselors, whether it's working with um, brand new administrators, they give us a challenge. They ask us to create a SMART goal, and from there we move on. With, and it's supposed to be, something that we work on once we leave there for quite some time. And uh, the last thing that I want to highlight is that every month in this room we have admin council. And for admin council we bring all of the principals together and all of the district leaders together. And um, we lately, actually we usually have PL but sometimes it's not every month, but this year, thanks to Dr. Turner, we have PL every single <coughs> month. And that PL, um, this year we focused on visible visible learning for literacy because literacy is a big goal of ours and we used Hattie's work, Hattie Fry and Fisher and uh, it was actually nice because years ago we talked about focusing on one book and maintaining that focus throughout the year so again it was instructional leadership um, and I think it's, it's really paid off. Um, we read the book then we, do, we delivered the pro professional learning one chapter at a time and there were only five chapters but we were able to spend more time on some other chapters and um, Actually, I think that that was it, unless you have questions about admin um, professional learning. And then the last slide just get, basically gives you an idea of some of the other forums that we offer. Um, Reimagining special education services, and I have to give Rosie Wynn a lot of support and a lot of kudos because, my goodness, she, um, we, took what, we took a moment to really focus on where we are and where we want to be. And we brought together a group of um, educators from all levels and all schools and, um, and just worked out some problems. And uh, I think that we have wonderful solutions. And if you just take a look at the rest of the list, I, I don't want to hold you and tell you about each one. But um, a lot of great things are happening here in Fayette County for professional learning. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. But if there's one thing, Kay, if I could get you to go back one slide to system-wide professional learning schedules. If you don't click on anything in this presentation, please click on that. Because there you get a chance to see just how much um, the instructional department, the curriculum department, just all of the different things we do at each level, and that's throughout the entire year. Okay, questions? I attended many of these programs as a principal, and I know you all do a great job with that. Mm -hmm. The Administrative Institute and Glissy and all those, a uh, wonderful job. You all do fantastic. The only thing, um, and this is not a criticism, mm -hmm. but I know, and there's never enough time, but for new teachers, I would have loved to have had the new teacher in my building more than just like the one day. And I know a lot of times that's out of your control, mm -hmm. but, uh, and again, I, I can only speak to the high school level, but yes. I know at the high school level, bringing in the department chair to work with them and me trying mm -hmm. to work with them, it, the one day goes by like yes. that. And, and I, I have to agree with you on that. In the past, this past year, we actually gave them an entire day. So they, ne they didn't come to us and then come to you, they spent the entire day. But even that's not enough. There's so many things that we want. It's almost like we're pulling. It's tug of war because the new teachers, um, there's so many things that we want to teach them. Um, but if we, if we could have two, that would be wonderful. We have four days, and we give one day to the schools. Um, and I wish I could, you know, my magic wand and give you two, and maybe one day you all can help us with that. <laughs> and just um, one more comment on the 
uh, professional learning for administrators, those administrative council PL sessions, you know, um, Ms. Presley King said thanks to Dr. Turner, but I want you to know that the heavy lift of designing, developing, and delivering that PL every month came from my core curriculum team, which are the uh, five coordinators, uh, Ms. Presley King, Ms. Heron, Ms. Gwynn, um, the ECS coordinators. Um, I think we had a, maybe one or two other folks that I might be leaving off that team. But they, I said, this is what we need to do. We need to build capacity for instructional leadership. And they took the ball and really ran with it. And um, I just got to watch great stuff happen. So I appreciate them very much. And I would also want you to know that even though we have two people in charge of professional learning, really everybody in the curriculum department participates in professional learning and in school improvement. Um, those aren't tasks that are designated just to two people. So, and thanks very much to my group for all the hard work with professional learning and building both teacher and administrative capacity. So. And just I know a, that, um, a comment as well, um, <coughs> Dr. Turner, Ms. Presley King, the. Uh, I, I think if you have an opportunity to go into and check the links, uh, you can see a, a tremendous amount of effort and time uh, has been given to this, and uh, we think that's critically important. So when uh, we talk about developing our new calendar, and I certainly want to, we'll speak to that later in the agenda, uh, finding time, making time for professional learning is critically important. Um, and I'll say this, if, if with Ray here and, and Kim not here, if that's all these two ladies did was professional learning, they'd still have more than their plate full. But they each have multiple other hats. They wear, uh, you know, the fine arts program, Title II, uh, you know, so we're trying to wrap all of that into that. But it's critically important, um, uh, and, and you look at the, the world of business, uh, they're always training and retraining their people. Uh, we don't go and get a degree and then we're all done. It's a, it's a constant learning process for all of us, both uh, teachers, um, administrators, support personnel. Uh, it's critically important that we continue that lifelong learning piece. So I, I think probably professional learning this year probably has been the best uh, that I've seen in my six years here. It's been very strong been very focused and I uh, want to commend both you ladies for that effort. Thank you very much. And we'll extend that to Ms. Aaron. Yep. I had a question mm -hmm. or comment. I don't know what it is. But uh, I've been to the administrators and um, professional learning and y'all do a phenomenal job. It's, it's amazing how excited people are and how much they actually learn there. And uh, I'm sure the teachers professional learning training is equally as good. And one thing you didn't mention here is um, our support staff. And this is just secondhand information. It might not even, might not even be true, but um, I just hear from time to time that our support staff really need some training in uh, things as basic as Excel and Word and Adobe and even our internal databases. And um, I just want to make sure that they have the competency they need also. And is that part of your training program? It is, and we do, we focus mainly on certified staff and administrators for this presentation, mm -hmm. but a lot of the learning, uh, professional learning for classified staff is more uh, digitally based, more online. There are, um, for example, if you want to learn how to use the Google suites of applications, there are modules that uh, classified staff can sign up for and participate in mm -hmm. and learn how to use those um, different tools that are there. Uh, if they need more training in Excel spreadsheets, because even though we have Google Sheets, we still use Excel quite a bit. That That is there for them. Mm -hmm. um, Tyler Muniz training is ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have training there for them. And then if they need something specific and they come to us and they say, I really need help with this, then we figure out a way to get them the yeah. training that they need. And with our paraprofessionals, we typically try to, the instructional ones, that we typically try to bring those in the same training that yes. the teachers receive as well. And we encourage so, parapros to um, participate in school-based professional learning. Yeah. And I know our bus drivers, they, they do their professional learning together all throughout the year. So um, clearly it, it's something that we want to continue to do and, and uh, specifically if there's a, uh, an employee group. I know our nurses have yeah. professional learning. If there's a, if there's. Well, the, the specific question that I get quite frequently mm -hmm 
is uh, somebody would call a school and they can't get information that's easily accessible on our internal databases because the person that answered the phone didn't know how to access that information. And um, I just might be one person at one school, but uh, I just wanted to uh, raise the awareness, I guess, and make sure that all of our staff have the training they need to handle the phone calls they get. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on the presentation agenda is um, some work that um, we've just started this uh, recently over the last couple of months. It deals with uh, an opportunity to provide scholarships for uh, very bright students in our district that may not have the wherewithal, the financial uh, support, or even the knowledge in how to pursue post-secondary opportunities. And Mr. Sweat and Ms. Gibbs, um, after talking with uh, the folks that head this program up, Brad Bryant and others, um, we had some discussion here, and it's certainly something that um, I, I, I left a handout on your seat in, in the board workroom, but I think that's part of your presentation as well. Uh, you can see that uh, we're one of the few counties that had not actually taken advantage of that. Um, I, there's no re particular reason for that other than the fact we already have a lot of students that are going to college anyhow. Uh, but when we say all students, we mean all students. So if we've got kids that are young people that want to go to school and have the uh, desire to work hard and, and get there, uh, we want to provide a way for them to get there. So Virginia and Sam, if y'all want to come speak to this any at all, we've got the presentation for you. It, it'll be pretty at a high level. Um, and uh, if you have questions, certainly feel free to ask Virginia. Let's try that. How about that? Yep. Is that better? Yep. All right, yep. great. Um, as Dr. Barrow said, I want to keep this very high end and really address any questions that you have. But at its core, as Dr. Barrow indicated, this is really a scholarship. Uh, targeted towards low income but academically promising students but that may need some additional either academic supports or social um, uh, type of supports and so the idea is to identify these students as rising eighth graders and um, through an application process uh, once the students are actually selected uh, they will be given both an academic uh, tutor or an academic mentor, um, typically either a counselor or somebody in the school, so a teacher, as well as an external mentor. And we intend uh, to use our Friends Mentoring Program, which is well established uh, in our system, to actually provide that support. Um, the students uh, will go through their high school uh, continuing with those supports. Uh, and the goal is to really um, help hopefully identify students that have promise um, but that need that at little bit extra. And in particular, in, in our, uh, I think in the heart of this program, if we can identify perhaps some first generation college students and then make sure that we're really providing those things to um, when they graduate from high school, they need to have at least a 2.5 GPA they need to have good behavior and good attendance, but at that point, uh, they will have the opportunity to have a $10,000 scholarship. And the beauty of this program is that both colleges and many of our technical schools will a actually either match or double match that amount. Um, these students, because of the way um, some of the qualifications for this scholarship, um, they will also be eligible for Pell Grants. So very easily, uh, they can take this $10,000 and leverage that into forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars um, debt free. And so we're excited um, not only to uh, be able to give those scholarships at the end of the day, but also to be able to provide the supports from here to there. Um, the actual $10,000 in the first year is provided through the Georgia Student Finance um, Organization. Um, in subsequent years, uh, our district, because of how we fall in the state, um, will be asked to actually provide um, half of that 
through working with our businesses and our community. And I will tell you from my position, um, I feel that part of it is going to be exceptionally doable. Um, so in other words, we'll um, have local partners uh, donate $5,000 and then the state will match that with another 5000 for the $10,000. Um, we can have as many as eight scholars named each year, and our hope is that uh, we'll actually be able to do that uh, for uh, September, which is when um, our first crop would be eligible. And if we're able to do that, we'll actually have a signing ceremony just like um, we do for our high, or our high school um, athletes and those types of things, um, but for our eighth graders that are um, going into this Georgia REACH scholarship program. Um, that is a very fa fast synopsis of it, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions or fill in any details that I haven't covered. I think it's a great deal. Yes. Um, we've already had, I know Virginia and Sam have already met with uh, some of our community people. We've actually had one of our uh, uh, colleagues, banking colleagues, uh, that participated in this uh, over in Car Clark County, and he's moved here with BB&T, and uh, he's already raised his hand and said, you know, we're going to help, we'll support. Uh, so it, I don't think it's going to be a hard thing for us, and it's going to help uh, a lot of our bright kids that maybe just don't have the knowledge base or wherewithal and there's a selection process I know we'll be meeting with our guidance counselors and it's not somebody oh, we're going to pick you because we like you or anything like that it's truly those kids who are most attentive and deserving and we'll have a strong pool and then we'll pick from the best okay. so, so how many do we how many slots if you will do we get eight, uh, eight a maximum of, of eight um, and so we'll go through it, um, take the applications, go through um, making sure that there are some specific criteria, um, make sure that those applications match the criteria, and then our um, goal is to have this advisory council actually interview the students and then make the final. And these um, are rising eighth graders. That you rising eighth graders. And we'll work with them all through their high school career there. Uh, in some schools I know uh, my alma mater, Georgia Southern, is one. The University of Georgia, they do that double match, so it really does give young people an opportunity to um, go to school and not have tons of debt when they get out. And um, so we're excited about the opportunity. It doesn't cost us anything other than just investing in our kids, and that's what we do anyhow. So money does not have to be an object to get a college education. That's um, that's what we want to try to get to for these kids. Okay. Hey, I, I understand something you said. Um, so we're going to raise $5,000 from local donors. It's not taxpayer money, right? That's correct. And then the state will donate another $5,000. Technically, the Georgia Student Finance um, is raising funds on their end as well. They're and raising so private funds? Correct. Okay, so that, that $10,000 per student is all private funds. I, that your understanding? I, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I, I'm not sure I can say that definitively. Mm -hmm. From a local standpoint, um, it but would be all... Um, outside, not school funds. board funds. It's, would, the board's not putting any money into Correct. this. I, I can answer that. Pretty well, then you said something about next year or in, in subsequent years. Yes. The same this, same situation. Uh, this, we'll be working what, what with changes business partners. After the so the very first year yeah. um, for this coming September's group, right. um, the Georgia Student Finance will put the full two, 10000 oh, is in. You. And so it gives us basically a so year. So we got a year to raise money. It's correct. So we got a year to raise $40,000. Mm -hmm. That's correct. There's and no penalty if in subsequent years, um, for some reason, our local community is not in a position to do that. There's no penalty if we don't have all eight scholars other than lost opportunity. But right. um, I will be very surprised if we're not able to um, yeah. actually accomplish that. We should be able to raise that money tomorrow afternoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a very generous community. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I'm just going down the list. Uh, so when they uh, match and double match, is that also coming from that same 
donation fund? That's the actual university or the technical school. Um, and there's a list um, later in the presentation of um, the specific. Yeah. Um, that comes from their scholarships, their, their foundations, okay. um, however they issue funds to students. I believe it's the next to the last slide, or two from the last slide. Right, right there. And there's another. That's, um, and you'll see double match or match. Um, basically, the institutions need to be HOPE qualified or HOPE eligible. Right. Um, it's state of Georgia. This is a state of Georgia program. But so that's not tax money either. That's, they're going in their private foundations to grab that money? Again, I, I can't, I'm not knowledgeable enough to speak for that. Um, and then this last $20,000, um, is that coming out of my pocket anyway? I, I know some of this money is going to come out of my pocket somehow. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out which, which pot's coming out in terms uh, of a, either a Georgia state taxpayer or a local taxpayer. And, uh, you know, there's so many organizations and foundations. And is, is all of this money um, private foundation money that's raised from the private sector or... I can speak to the local plan. Uh, again, I, I, I can't speak to the state piece of it, but from a local standpoint, um, uh, our 100% um, of the match will come from uh, non-taxpayer funds in, in our community. Yeah, it's not so much the 5,000 as the 60,000 I'm curious about. <laughs> you know, how much of that am I going to be able to get, get collected from me? And, and the you know the George taxpayers, I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I can't tell if this is a. Uh, <coughs> Some of it's hope money, right? yeah, yeah. tax dollar, but right. then you know we can use it to support. I mean, yeah, they're I'm researching right, right, right now. We're trying, what, what <laughs> trying to find. That, there's lots of, uh, and like I said, we're a little bit late in the game coming to this as a county. You look at all the other counties, and I'm not saying we do something just because mm -hmm. other counties. Do yeah, I think it's a great idea. I just wonder who's paying for it. Are we no. paying for it, or is my neighbors paying for it? Or <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Yeah. That's the question that I would. Virginia, on the rubric for those eight spots, is without having to explain it all, is is income the highest category, or academic achievement the highest category, or are they equal weight? So um, the uh, income is uh, is basically a requirement um, piece of it. Um, from the academic stand, standpoint, um, 2.5 GPA is uh, what the REACH Georgia. So yeah, I guess I picture a model where there's 150 applicants for these eight spots, right? This is very lucrative. It's, right. it's amazing. So once you meet the income bar, then it's on the merit of your application to get the award? That, that's correct. And that's part of the reason um, I think the best practices is to actually have an engaged community advisory that sure. will interview the students and knowing that these are seventh grade students applying and their parents. Um, and so really being able to not only see what's on paper, but also to have a chance to understand um, sort of the interests, the aspirations and, and the rest of the story as well. Um, so um, there are some specific requirements. They do have to be a, a U.S. citizen or um, uh, able to have legal residency. That's a requirement. Um, they do need to be uh, attendance-wise. They can't be truant. And, um, and then certainly behavior. There are specific behavior requirements. So there will be um, a, a look in to make sure that they are behaving well and continue to be behave well through their high school <coughs> years. They have to be, um, they, they can't have um, been um, um, convicted of a crime or a drug offense or those types of things. So um, I do think one of the um, preference areas in selection is if uh, if we do uh, identify students that are first generation college that's attendees, that's I think I that's thinking. part of the heart of, of the yeah. scholarship as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure we'll come up with eight outstanding candidates. <laughs> we have met with our middle school uh, seventh grade counselors already uh, one from each of our schools, and I think they are um, trying to get the word out and um, to, to get in some um, applications to make sure that our families know about it and um, get those applications started. Good deal. Great. All Any right. Any questions? 
We'll keep you posted as we move along through this, and um, at some point in time, I suspect those young people, uh, we might get to meet them personally once uh, we get to that point. Uh, so we're excited about the opportunity to offer it. So thank you, Virginia. Thank you so much. Those are all of our presentations. Mr. Hollowell, we can move on to mm -hmm. superintendent's report. Uh, if you were ready to yep. go there, yep. good deal. Um, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Satterfield, if you all want to come up, I, I would like to say this with regard to the facilities update. If you have any questions there, we're happy to answer those for you. But um, the thing that I want to uh, capitalize on and, and speak to is uh, yesterday we had the opportunity to have the uh, dedication for the Fayette County High School Auditorium. Uh, I think it was a wonderful celebration. I know several of you were able to, to be in attendance. and. Um, uh, I think it was a glorious celebration of our young people and their talents and the quality of our instructors and uh, not to mention, um, you know, when the orchestra was playing, I closed my eyes and I thought I was in the uh, New, New York Philharmonic Orchestra. It was really, really strong. It was great. So uh, it turned out well. Our architect was there. Our construction people were there. It was really a great community event and um, appreciate the board. I, in fact, I. Uh, Y'all hadn't fussed at me yet, but I ask our, all of our board, past and present, to stand and, and let the community recognize our board because we couldn't do this work without you, and we appreciated that support. So, Mike, I may have stolen some of your thunder, but uh, any other facility update That's highlights? That's number one on my list. There you go. Well, I'm, I'm, we're moving right along then. Um, we uh, just about finished up on, on the last summer's projects as far as the punch list. They are wound down. And I expect that we'll receive the final payout on uh, the uh, Stars Mill, Rise Star, Peoples, and probably the auditorium within the month. Uh, they've, they've wound those down. Um, Fayette County High School will be renovating the bottom floor uh, of that facility this summer. Um, had a coordination meeting with the, the high school staff principal and assistant principals just this morning. So we're, we're gearing up for that. Uh, McIntosh High School Edition continues to roll along. It, it appears we should finish up sometime this month. Um, they're, they're in good shape there. Um, we've been uh, working pretty diligently the last month on the security vestibules. They're coming along real well, I, I would think. Uh, by probably middle of end of June, they'll be completely done. Um, Torrance Construction's doing a good job there. Uh, Torrance is also doing the Sandy Creek, uh, Sandy Creek Film Lab workforce, and uh, uh, shortly after spring break, they started demolition work there, and look forward to them putting it back together, and uh, we'll, we'll finish that up this summer. Um, last week, we poured the foundation for the first of our band towers. Uh, got that in at, at Fayette County High, and the actual tower is supposed to ship in in about two weeks. So uh, we expect by the first part of June that that will, will be completed. Um, working hard, the architects are working on the Oak Grove design for the additions and renovations there and also working on the stagecoach uh, middle school design, working on those drawings. We got the uh, RFP out on the streets right now, looking forward to getting in those proposals next Tuesday from uh, a number of contractors, and then the committee will be reviewing those and uh, bringing uh, a couple names of some contractors to the board for, for them to review. And uh, we're uh, getting close to uh, starting on the connector at North Fayette. The contractor's gotten all their stuff ordered so they can hit the ground running that last week in May. We'll get cranked up there. Good deal. So looking forward to another busy summer. May not be quite as busy as last summer, but that's a good thing, too. <laughs> so, um, Any questions for Mr. Satterfield, Mr. Sanders? Uh, about any of the projects. I will say this, and I, um, I talked with Mike about this this morning, the, uh, the dedication plaque for the auditorium. Um, if you didn't see that, we had it, uh, but we discovered uh, a misspelled name, so we didn't want to put that up. 
Um, it, it didn't come from us, but we did find that, so we uh, uh, that should be up within the next week or two when they uh, get They it said it was about six-day turnaround to okay. get, get the plaque redone, but we had uh, one Good too deal. many S's somewhere. Some, somebody's name, huh? Good deal. But uh, that'll be up shortly. And, and um, uh, anyhow, uh, any other questions for Mr. Satterfield? Great stuff. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, just a, a little bit of follow-up. Um, I know that we've had our math textbook adoption presentation. Uh, Ms. Troutman, our math coordinator, and Dr. Turner have been working with that. Um, we um, need to let that lay out on the table for 30 days. We couldn't quite get it in before this work session, so we're going to actually bring that back to you. Uh, at the May 20th meeting, and uh, Dr. Turner, we talked a little bit. I, I haven't gotten any specific con, uh, comments or conversations or any feedback. Have you and or Ms. Troutman received uh, any information on that regard? I talked with Ms. Troutman today. She said uh, so far she's received one parent evaluation, and it was positive, so generally no comment from the yeah. public on that. I've seen a lot of people looking through the material out here in the front, uh, but uh, we'll keep you posted on that kind of feedback if, if we get it. But um, we'll hopefully bring this over to the board uh, action item recommendation um, on the 20th. Any questions there? If not, I'll uh, move on down to the attendance and enrollment reports. And um, this was a uh, snapshot was taken at the very end of April. Uh, and we're actually at 20,354 students. That's uh, actually over the 200 mark, 204 students more than we were last year at the same time. Uh, I think that's good, good sign. Um, and so we're, we're growing uh, a little bit, and that's the good kind of growth that you'd like to have. Um, uh, you know, I, I went through and looked at all the schools. We have some where there's uh, increase, some decrease, and we just track that. I don't know that there's any particular reason for that to happen, but um, uh, clearly uh, we're headed in the right direction as far as the regrowth is concerned. Uh, any comments or questions? Okay. I'll move on to item D then. We're going to get through with this agenda here real quick. It's a good thing. Moving through, we um, have been working on the calendar preparation. Uh, one of the things that we do do is have our um, employees have a chance to actually vote. But one of the things that I'd ask Mr. Sweat and Dr. Turner to do this time around was to actually push, push out um, surveys for the community and the parents to provide feedback. Uh, we've got this um, survey for the 2021 uh, and this will also be the 21-22 school year. Uh, we'll be pushing this out, but I wanted you to actually see the survey. Uh, we'll take a look at all this data once it's in and compiled. We'll certainly share that with you uh, so that uh, people have an opportunity in the community to, uh, we'll, we'll certainly take that into consideration. Um, I, we've given some rationale about where it is and what uh, we like, what we don't like, and certainly you'll take that into our consideration and feedback. Any comments there? Oh, that's good. Okay, next we move on to um, a, an item that may take a little more discussion. And uh, come on out, Mr. Gray, our budget development update. I know that uh, we continue to work on this. Um, as we um, uh, get more information from uh, our revenue streams and looking at our expenses and recommendations from staff, and uh, we um, uh, know that we're going to have some increase in the budget primarily because if we didn't look at anything else other than the $3,000 teacher raise, that's going to be uh, between six and seven million dollars just with that one item. And uh, so, uh, we're still working on this. Our goal is to try to bring something to the board that we can somewhat tentatively approve, uh, hopefully at the near the end of May. Uh, but I'm going to be quiet and let Tom walk you through this, and um, we'll uh, be happy to answer any questions for you. 
Not a whole lot has changed on this worksheet since the last time we met. Um, your state revenue at the top of page one comes out to eleven and a half million dollars. Uh, yeah, one hundred eleven point five million dollars. Um, the local revenues is one hundred sixteen point five. Is the estimate now that with the increase in the digest um, that we expect at this point, based on the information we received from the tax assessors office, so that'd give us a total of. Uh, revenue stream uh, during a year of about $228 million um, with our projected fund balance of just under $30 million um, at the end of this year. So, On page two, um, you have our baseline start of the uh, current salaries and budget. At the top was about $192 million. And then you have the increases. Um, there you see that first group of increases are all increases in based on their uh, employee step, the TRS, the uh, certified salary schedule, and the 2% COLA. Those, all those items add up to about $9.5 million uh, in increases. The next group is the allotment increases, um, which are the um, positions that were added to the school-based allotment sheets, and those uh, total $1.6 million. Um, below that you have the uh, program and support additions um, that we've gone through with um, uh, the different schools and departments and executive cabinet and discussed and tried to pare down what we thought were the priorities of those. Um, and in that area you have about $1.3 million, $1,256,000 in uh, estimated increases in those positions. So, um, and I did go through and look and you know, you have about um, not every one of those additions are actual position additions because some of it is just changing supplements or um, where the person's uh, located and things like that. But there's about 12 and a half positions that will be school based there. And then there's some adjustment, like two additional central office positions, a position we're converting from federal to, um, to local, and then a couple positions that are being reclassed or retooled. So, those are the additions right now. There are some additional positions that we've looked at and still haven't uh, made a decision on yet or haven't made a recommendation on that aren't on this, reflected on this. Um, but, and those are still pending and, you know, having those discussions um, with, at the uh, district level and, you know, with the board as to what needs to be, what's right. appropriate. And, and to, to also jump in here, I know we've gotten a few questions that we're pulling information on uh, I want to share that information with all of our board. Uh, it's uh, uh, This is the good time to ask those questions right now because uh, we need to be able to share the thinking and the rationale behind that if we're recommending, um, you know, uh, uh, some additional slides. I just, I just had a qu that. quick question yeah, sure. about the um, the $3,000 increase at 6 to $7 million. That's our local portion for benefits? Well, that's what it cost us. And we're estimating and not understanding exactly everything they're doing on the funding formula side because they haven't released that information. They've just given us an estimate. But if you look back on the first page under the revenue, I'm estimating that about 75% of the cost of that is being funded through the um, QBE earnings. So you'll see at the top, funding for teacher salary increase is estimated at 75% of estimated cost. So. They're increasing our QBE earnings on page one, uh, nine million dollars, and that includes the three thousand dollar increase in the state teacher salary schedule. Okay. It does not include T and E the training for the, the 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 T and E. So we haven't seen those final numbers from the state as right. to how they're getting to the funding. But we're going to have to pay for the benefits. Correct. So yes. How much do we think that might be? Um, well, I would say if you if you look at the total cost of what it's uh, the increase is, which is sorry, uh, six point two million dollars, we're we're probably having the funds about twenty five percent of that is my estimate at this point. Okay, directly, yeah. And that would include FICA, which we pay all of that, and uh, the increase in TRS. Okay. Um, so all of those additions above our baseline uh, staffing level at this point is about $12.6 million uh, would be going into next year. Um, then if you look on page three, um, you see we have some operating increases, some for the schools based on 
just having some additional students. We're uh, allocating additional money for that. Uh, some changes in the departmental budgets, uh, which include uh, fuel increase, and we do have to have some, uh, pay for some of the math book, textbook adoption in the general fund because of the type of uh, purchase it is. And then we have uh, additional pre-K classes, RTC, and some S&P uh, stuff that's adding. Plus, I think there's some additional capital in that non-departmental at this point. So uh, total increase in the budget would be $15.3 million um, this year compared to last year. So. Um, that would still leave us, even after having our budgetary reserve balance of $22 million, 20, almost $23 million, about uh, 6.9 available in the additional bu budgetary reserve. So, um, I didn't know if there were any more questions. I, I had the next steps that we would take at this point is continue to talk about the um, position request that we have to see um, if you know what it, we're able to to work with it with inside the budget. Uh, May 20th, which is the next board meeting, um, we would need to have a comment section uh, for the public to make uh, comments and uh, to the board about the budget, um, so they could have some input. Have input. That would be the first of two sessions that we would need to have open. At that time, we would also have the tentative budget um, ready for adoption by the board, um, and that will be the first time that you vote on it. You've actually voted on it twice. You vote on it two times. And then you voted on a third time when you adopt the millage rate, but you have to have two um, votes on the budget. So that would be May 20th for the first one. And then June 3rd, we would have the second public comment um, session. That's at the work session. And then June 17th, we would have the final adoption of the budget. So we can make changes between the 20th and 17th. Um, as long as they're not too drastic, we don't have to do any additional advertising or start over again. Um, but that is the schedule we're at at this point. And those changes can be either up or down. So that's just, correct. Just looking at that. Yeah. Um, but we're getting close to uh, being able to share what we think uh, is a real solid budget with the board. Um, and, and what those last few positions that we're pulling some additional information on, trying to uh, do some value judgment and what kind of uh, impact it'll have on the district, both pro and con, and then ultimately we can bring our best recommendations to the board um, and uh, look forward to the tentative adoption. Hey, Tom. Um, yes. On page, on page two, um, yeah. you got the total personnel 191 and 2.4 in that list, and you just said that the 6.2 million is going to cost us, I don't know, estimate about 1.6 in local funds, about 25% of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I bet some of those numbers are half, and some of them are are, are 100 percent. But how much of that 12.6 million would you say is uh, locally funded? Well, I'll put it this way: we are when you're talking about any of the you know positions that you're looking that we're adding down below here, whether it's the two gifted teachers or the the one ESOL teacher. Or, um, or any of those additional, those are all above what the QBE is funding because we've already allotted more teachers than what the QBE base formula. So we're really picking up all of those, except for maybe, you know, you can make the argument on the gifted that we don't have as many gifted teachers as uh, uh, assigned as we actually earn. So we, we try to make that adjustment because of that. Um, so, but so overall, you know, we have more teachers than what we earn on the QBE formula. So probably about $10 million of that is um, easily uh, local funding? Yes. Okay. I, I wouldn't argue with that. So, you know, it's hard to say when, you know, because of the way they handle the, the training, uh, what they call T&E, training and experience. Mm -hmm. At this point, they've only given us the aggregate number. They haven't given us the details of how they, uh, the, how they get into that. You know, so they do fund some of the TRS. They do fund some, they fund the, the Medicare uh, on the teacher salary schedule. They don't fund any FICA. We have to pick up all the FICA. Well, and, and one thing too, uh, <coughs> Dr. Marksman, I think this kind of goes to your question. The uh, we do have uh, a number of locally funded teachers. Uh, right. Most all of that, I won't say 100 percent, but most all of that goes to meet. Uh, the class size expectation numbers that the board has set for us. So, you know, um, 
we can always increase class size and, and cut back on the numbers of teachers, but that has not been uh, the sentiment of this board, uh, at least during my time here. So we, we, um, uh, we can always operate less expensively, but there's going to be contingencies that we have to look at where the, the class size is going to have to go up. If we have fewer numbers of, of uh, teachers and, and more kids in those classrooms, so um, that's something to keep in mind as we're going through this. Yes. You know, I guess one way to look at this too is if you look at the additions. You know, there's uh, 16 um, certified staff in the allotment sheets. If you even if you take out the seven that are ECS lead teachers, that's nine, and then we have 12 and a half in the rest of the list. You know, that's 20 over 20 positions. We didn't earn 20 more positions in the QBE formula this year, so, um, and I don't know what the number is that we actually earned was increased, but so that does increase the local funding. I think it is does. the question. Yeah. And I think you know, and, and we look at the um, uh, different program areas and categories, um, depending upon how we serve our kids and and how we staff that, uh, we technically can earn more gifted funding. For example, we've got more gifted. Uh, students than we're actually earning funds for, but we've got to have gifted teachers in order to be able to do that. And, um, you know, that's not a one to one wash, I can tell you up front, but uh, a lot of um, uh, that would be what we consider to be forward funding. We have to pay for the teachers up front, and then we get the FTE increase in the following year. Um, and that, you know, that's. It's just the cost of doing business yeah. in, in the way the funding formula works for us. Yeah. Un, under the director of federal programs, what do you mean there by funding analysis pending? Well, we've been trying to determine the uh, different ways that that might affect the general fund based on how it's structured. Um, there are uh, some things that can be done that would uh, require us, depending on how we structure it, would require us to pick up the whole amount. Um, there are other things that could be done that we would pick it up based on the, the time amount split. So that um, decision hasn't been completely vetted on how we would handle that. So um, we kind of tried to pick a middle of the road number based on what we think you know might happen if, if some of the time is general fund, some of the time is all Title I or you know and the other federal programs. The problem with um, having any of that money, still pay for those positions is that's less money going to the Title I schools. So we were trying to fund it such that there was more Title I money going directly to the Title I schools, trying to maximize that. And then I just, um, a question about the ROTC teacher, is that for um, a new program at Whitewater? That's actually an, an expansion at Fayette County High School. Um, their program is at a point where the Army is willing to f um, fund another teacher. So they don't fund all of it, but right, they are, right. they're they are willing to fund another teacher. So. Okay. I have a question. Um, I'm still forming an opinion on this, so uh, this is just uh, this isn't a question for Tom, I guess, but uh, I was talking to um, the superintendent, a former superintendent of one of the larger school districts in Georgia about the academic research uh, concerning school size, class size and uh, we had a really hard time finding any academic research that uh, shows that class size is a significant factor in student performance. And um, there might be research we couldn't find, but um, you know, I was talking to a guy that had been a superintendent for decades, and um, I've done my own research. And um, I know that's um, not true in every class and every situation, so um, I guess my question to the staff would be, what? You know, if we were going to change our numbers, I'm not saying that I'm recommending that. But, sure. But if we were going to change those numbers, um, where is it critical? Where, where, where is class size critical? Is it kindergarten, first grade? Is it you know some high school class? Or um, because it's hard to find academic research that says it's critical across the board. And um, so uh, if we want to make research-based decisions, I'm doing my research. Sure. <laughs> but um, so I would like some feedback on that. Um, Sometime during this budget process, okay. uh, that would be great. And I'll say one thing related to that: a lot of these additions you see are not just trying to affect class size. I would say they're also trying to affect program offerings. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Thank you.
today. Looking at um, item 4F, um, we've been contacted by the uh, Fayette County Development Authority. They're offering a training session for elected officials. Um, I, since we have uh, three of our board members that have shared that they uh, would like to attend or can attend this training session, certainly wanted to make sure that uh, we put this in the minutes and that we've made this announcement here publicly that we will have three of our board members attending this session. Um, uh, there's no board of education business conducted at this time. This is learning about uh, what the development authority is trying to do in recruiting business and industry to our community and what role we may play as uh, elected officials, what role you board members play. And um, uh, we're looking forward to receiving the training and seeing what we can learn with the other governmental, uh, I don't know who the other governmental uh, f officials are that will be attending, but I know that all of the municipalities and county government have been invited to attend. So we'll, uh, we'll certainly keep um, the rest of the board informed. Um, and um, if you have any questions about it as we go through the training, please feel free to call us. Um, item 4G deals with the uh, Georgia School Boards Association. I uh, did want to uh, confirm that we submitted our uh, exemplary board application. Uh, Kay sent that, I guess, on the 30th. And um, uh, we'll uh, be looking forward to the review of GSBA, and, and I suspect uh, we'll have some good news maybe in June when we're at the GSBA Spring Conference there. Um, Last but not least, I did uh, want to uh, let them know as far as our superintendent report was concerned, is that the uh, uh, Hanover survey for alum, alumni and graduating seniors is currently out right now. And um, I haven't done a, a, a check recently about the number of students that had completed the survey. And I did check early just after we had pushed it out. Uh, we actually had more alumni responding than we have this year. Current seniors, I suspect they've been busy taking finals and uh, taking AP exams and those kinds of things. But we'll, uh, as soon as that survey is done and completed, we'll give you a uh, executive summary report. That should be sometime later this summer. Uh, and I think this is the, I believe the thir four, third or fourth year that we've actually done this. So we're get beginning to get some longitudinal data. Uh, over time, so that, that'll be interesting to see. Okay, any other questions on the superintendent's report? No, sir. Nope. If not, uh, we'll move on to uh, personnel, and uh, we have a, a, a personnel report submitted to you. I'd like to recommend all those individuals to the board uh, after going through. These are some of our principal ships and assistant principal ships, and uh, would like to recommend that to the board. Need a motion? So moved. Second. Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? Yeah, are we done hiring our full staff for next year? Yep. Mm, uh, we're close. Uh, there are a couple of other assistant principal positions that may come open. Yeah, and, we have uh, a head person at every school with us vote. I'm sorry. We have our head person at every school with us vote. I think we're in good shape. Yes, yes sir. Okay. Okay. Call the question. All in favor? I vote. Okay, well, uh, while we're here, I would like to uh, at least acknowledge a couple of folks that are in the audience. I, I see them there, and um, uh, <laughs> first of all, I'm, I'm going to embarrass them here just a little bit. Miss Erin Angelo uh, is here. She's been a great principal for us, and uh, uh, she'll be going to uh, Braylon Elementary School. So, Erin, wave and smile. There you go. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Miss. Kathy Smith, I see her out in the audience. She'll be going to Rising Star Middle School as our new principal there. And uh, there are others, and we'll we'll uh, make those announcements uh, as we get out. But I did I saw those two ladies out in the audience. Congratulations to both of them. Congratulations. Um, we um, uh, are excited about uh, both our internal hires and external hires. Uh, I mentioned uh, Miss Angelo moving from. Mentor to Braylon, uh, a gentleman by the name of John Gibbis uh, will be coming to us. He'll be actually be at our May meeting, and uh, he'll be moving into the principalship at Sarah Hart Mentor. So, uh, 
Uh, we're excited about uh, the uh, folks coming on board and look forward to great things from these individuals. Um, last but not least is one action item. We had this uh, project discussed uh, with you. We had folks from the county here, but this is the Kenwood Road School Zone. Uh, this is an intergovernmental um, opportunity uh, for us to work with the county. We have some traffic issues out uh, in front of North Fayette Elementary where um, uh, our folks feel like there's some it's a little bit hazardous and we feel like we need to be able to try to correct that. Um, this is, um, I think, a great thing. It's a, a, a good example of intergovernmental collaboration and cooperation. Uh, the county is going to do most of the work. Uh, the board uh, has been asked to pay for part of that. Our portion is about uh, just under $180,000. Uh, the county's portion is a good bit more than that. Um, but uh, I think it's a win-win for our kids and, and our parents, and it will certainly keep us much safer. So we wanted to put that on the, um, on the table and, and recommend the board approve. Uh, the county's already approved this. They've already signed off on their share. Uh, need a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions or discussion? Mr. Sanders, did I leave anything off? I, I think it's pretty much all in the, uh, no, in the it, agreement. It's all there, and I, I do have Courtney and Joe here with us who presented before if there are any questions, but it's, uh, it's as it was. And they did note in the uh, email that the, the dollar figures that have been presented is with them bidding it out. Uh, if there's a possibility of doing some internal work, that may save some money there. So I'll just point that out as well. Okay. Okay. So this is things in the decree that was by the actually way. putting that turn in road right. uh, up, uh, it's on our property so uh, it'll it'll revert to us it belongs to us but the county's going to help uh, put it in for us you said it's coming out recently yes sir mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I did. yeah just make sure we're talking about the same thing yes yeah, yeah. Um, all in favor by a vote Okay, um, moving on to information items. One of the things that um, um, I had the pleasure of, of having a conversation with a uh, uh, representative customer service individual from the Georgia Lottery Corporation, and um, I think these numbers are absolutely amazing uh, when you look at uh, the lottery that actually started in 1994. And initially, when that was started, you had pre-K, you had hope, you also had some capital money, primarily dealing with technology. Uh, that lasted for about a year or two, and they, the income wasn't as much as what they had hoped for, so the technology went away, but pre-K and hope uh, scholarship, hope grant monies has remained consistent. And over that time, from 1994 to 2018, uh, the total return to the county from the proceeds is over $603 million. That's our HOPE scholarship. That's our pre-K money. You can see the, uh, the retailers, they actually get about 6%. So uh, the people who sell those here in our, in our county, they've earned over 35, just under $36 million. You see what's been paid out. You see the number of HOPE students. That's almost 27,000 students that have positively benefited. Uh, you can see the amount of HOPE dollar pre-K, and, and um, I just thought that'd be interesting. We're getting some return on that, and whether you purchase uh, uh, tickets or not, you can see those people who do have helped um, a lot of kids get through school. So it's um, probably one of the more successful programs in the country. And uh, Do they still um, provide capital dollars for us? I see so there's some capital outlay here. Is that... Yes, sir. No, so that the capital dollars that's kind of pretty much gone away. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we do have a little bit in pre K monies where they'll actually provide some things for the classroom, that kind of stuff. That's something we could apply for. Yes, sir. No, I'd, I'd love to. <laughs> It'd be nice if we could tap into that, Dr. Bayer. I think if you notice the footnote on that, yeah, um, it's it ended in 2001. Yeah, that's that gonna say yeah. it, didn't, it didn't last too long. Right. That's um, I it was great while it lasted, but there just wasn't enough to 
the hope the scholarship piece was so positive that um, um, you know we that's pretty much ate up all the money uh, that and pre-k. I just want to thank the gamblers for helping my kids get through school. Yeah, so. hope hope so, <laughs> hope so. Last but not least, I know uh, one of the things that I've already mentioned Hanover Research. That's a uh, you know a company we partner with uh, to help do research for us, and I know one of the things that you. Uh, have asked and, and board members have asked about how can we close achievement gaps and help those kids that are um, not where they need to be and we have a pretty comprehensive uh, research package that we had asked uh, Hanover to work for us. Um, I think there's some really good suggestions in there. We've shared this information with all of our instructional staff, our building principals uh, across the board and uh, certainly uh, uh, we want to take good research and put it to use. So I thought I'd share that whole report with you. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to, to ask those. Um, I do have uh, a need to go into executive session for uh, some property discussion and also uh, some personnel issues I need to bring to the board's attention. Okay. Need a motion to go to executive session to discuss uh, property and personnel? Second. All in favor? 5 0. -oh. All right, we have a motion to return from executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Any recommendations from executive session? Uh, no, sir, no recommendations at this time. Okay, without objection, we are adjourned. Hmm.